Hey everybody, it's Trags, and this week on Red Sox Beat, I welcome back good friend and old colleague Alex Barth of 98.5 The Sports Hub. You can, of course, follow him on Twitter at RealAlexBarth. Today, we are going to be talking about the resilient Red Sox. They have overcome quite a lot in the past seven days since we last spoke, Alex. Uh, the covid uh, pandemic that has really hit them hard, the injured list. They've had no fewer than 11 players in the last 10 days placed on COVID IL. And what's to me most significant about that, of those players, five have been pictures. Still, they managed to go on a four-game winning streak uh, the day after uh, Xander Bogarts, their best player, arguably, was pulled off the field in the second inning by Alex Cora. Look, say what you will about the Red Sox slumping, you know, after the all-star break and for a good portion of August, but this team in the last week has shown me something. Yeah, they have. And, you know, when I was on with you, whatever it was last week, right? What are, we were talking about, what do they need to do to win the division? I said, just, they got to at least split with Tampa and then they got to win every series from there on out. They split with Tampa. They won their first series. So, uh, they're doing what they need to do right now, and in all things considered, everything they're going through, it's it's pretty darn impressive. They had something called a Cutter Crawford on the mound yesterday. Yes, I know they didn't win the game, but you know he gave them enough innings where they didn't have to drain the bullpen. They still won the series. That in itself felt like sort of a win for them, just given the situation they're in right now. So it does feel like they're turning the corner. Whatever August was, it was. That was a mess. The Red Sox, I actually looked this up. I, I kind of stumbled on this by accident. The Red Sox in years 2-0-X-1, so 20 blank one, always collapse late in the season. 2001, they were like, six, the winning percentage was right around 60% through July. August and September, it was barely 40%. That is when, yeah, I, I will remind you, that's when Joe yep. Kerrigan took over and okay. was uh, giving uh, hitting advice to people like Troy O'Leary. I remember covering that team and um, that's that was the year, of course, of the famous or the infamous uh, Nomar Garcia Parra by the uh, beverage uh, stand in the back of the clubhouse saying that's why nobody wanna, wants to effing play here. Um, that was a uh, fall of great frustration. Of course, that's when 9-11 happened. And, um, but uh, that was a team that was 65 and 53 and collapsed under Joe Kerrigan after they fired Jimmy Williams. Continue. So again, 2001, like you just said, they collapsed. Obviously, we all remember 2011. Now 2021, it feels like this is a trend. This is as far as I'll ever dip into sabermetrics, but I'll tell you this. There's the, the, the 2021 Red Sox, or it's 2021 now, the 2031 Red Sox could open the season 50 and 0. I'm not believing in that team because I know what happens. But anyway, my, yes. my point being, you you don't really, and I, because I, I stumbled upon this because I was looking back on, okay, how do teams do, that's struggling, like do teams that struggle in August automatically struggle in September? Could you be a good team through July, just bottom drops out in August, come back in September? It's kind of mixed results, but that's kind of what this team's looking to do right now. It's not something that occurs a ton. Generally, September performance, and the reason I'm specifically looking at those two months is, you know, you look at August, if you fall apart in August, odds are you're falling out of the playoff race. It's very easy to get in that mindset of, all right, well, here we go. We're out of it. There's one month left. Just mail it in. I feel like the Red Sox have to fight that off right now. In some ways, I almost wonder if the COVID situation helps with that because it sort of gives them something to rally around. But, right. you know, early on, it's it's a promising start here that they're not going to let that August define them and they're not ready to write themselves off. So instead of having names like the names that all Red Sox fans are familiar with, uh, Josh Taylor, uh, Hiro Sawamura, Josh Taylor, and uh, Nick Pavetta, who could have started yesterday, but he was on right. COVID, would have started. Um, that's why we uh, got the uh, Cutter Crawford experiment out of AAA Worcester. But instead of those names in the bullpen, yesterday we had John Schreiber, then um, Gonzalez, uh, Bra Ryan Brazier, uh, Robles, and then Phillips Valdez. Look, I mean, not to bust on those guys, but they are what they are. That's not what the Red Sox thought right. they would be going to in a game on September 5th, uh, trying to fight for a second wild card spot. Yeah, it, it's the reality of it. And again, you kind of get these spot performances from these guys here or there 
again, I thought even though he didn't necessarily pitch well, Crawford kept them in the game. He gave them enough innings where they didn't have to go to, you know, say um, the, the uh, Whitlock. They didn't have to go to Garrett Whitlock to bridge innings or anything, right? He got them deep enough into the game. A guy like, um, see, I, I don't even know this guy's name. It's Jack Lopez, right? Right. The second baseman who is a capable defender right now. He might be the best defensive infielder the Red Sox have. It kind of feels that way. Um, but, you know, you get these little spot performances here. And, and I think that that's sort of what's carrying the team right now. But you don't that's not they're not in a spot where you can kind of have feel good stories. They need to win games. They're right up against it. They're a half back for the Yankees for that first wild card spot. I think they're three. They're four ahead of Oakland, Oakland after Oakland collapsed on Sunday. Oakland lost yesterday. OK, so they're four and a half up on Oakland. So they do have a little bit of breathing room there. But, you know, they're right in the middle of it. And these feel good stories will only get you so far at a certain point. You got to start winning games and i think the other important thing to remember is it's you know it's not like they're going to bring these guys right back maybe some of them you know xander bogarts i think is just a machine but can nick pavetta come back after missing what's probably going to be two weeks and just start and be good or is there going to need to be lead time into that can you know any of these guys matt barnes is he going to need lead time to shake the rust off so this is kind of an ongoing thing so you're looking at it and you're thinking okay cutter crawford's not going to be in the starting rotation if he doesn't have to be but is he a guy that maybe adds some depth to that bullpen that, that helps kind of give you a little bit longer? I, I don't think they're looking at that. Yeah. And not you don't to think cut so? you off. No, I mean, I, I think they want to get their bullpen back to the way it was working. I, uh, I think they want to, I guess in what the middle of May and June, that's right. what, the, that's the, the goal. And I think they have enough starting pitching uh, now that Chris Sale has returned, that they can put guys like Martin Perez in the bullpen. Well, they had put Martin Perez right. in the bullpen. That's the objective. I don't think you know, you're not looking at bringing up somebody like Cutter Crawford and so, then throwing him in the middle of the bullpen in a pennant race. I don't so, think that's okay. Maybe, maybe I phrased that wrong. Maybe I guess more what I was saying is it's not like, and we don't know the situation with these guys if they're symptomatic or not, right? But you remember like Jason Tatum said he was still using an inhaler throughout the NBA season. Like there's lingering effects. You don't just snap your fingers and get mid season. No, it, it, it varies. Just, I mean, first of all, right. I mean, the reason I don't like that comparison of that analogy, Alex is because Jason Tatum is exerting no, I, like a hundred percent cardio effort during an NBA game in baseball. It's clearly different. I mean, they're athletes, right. they're elite athletes. Don't get me wrong, but they're not exerting the same type of, uh, energy that a hockey player, a basketball player, even a but football you don't think, player is. You don't think after, you know, I think it's coming up on two weeks for Barnes. You don't think after two weeks, especially if he's dealing with some physical stuff, that there could be rust? Oh, I, I'm sure there could be. I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I think it is probably uh, a little easier for baseball players to come back from this if they are keeping up training for sure on their own. And keeping up cardio on their own, which everything I read, they, they are doing that. Uh, most players you hear, if they're confined in a home or a hotel, what have you, uh, they work on cardios, they do sit-ups, they do whatever they have to do uh, to keep in reasonable shape. And you're not talking about a situation. In some cases, these guys can be out 10 days and then be right back, literally 10 days or 12 right. days if they have to be two days negative. Um after the 10 day uh, quarantine. So, you know, it varies from case to case. That's why this is so difficult for a lot of teams and a lot of teams just who are in the pennant race have to play it day by day. This is uh, what we're up against. This is what we have to deal with, unfortunately, what they have to deal with. And, you know, the Red Sox are no different. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'd agree with all that. I, I, I don't think you're wrong. I'm just saying, you know, having options in case guys aren't ready right away isn't necessarily a bad thing like i don't again you have rafael devers playing second base right now or he he was the other day right if you know you have a guy you can just you're up you can stick out there in the eighth or ninth inning who's actually played the position who's capable just having that buffer i feel like kind of makes things a little easier right uh, on everybody so that that's all i'm saying it's just kind of you know you're looking for guys to be the buffer at this point because like you said they can't really afford to lose games so you know i guess the flip side of that would be you know if they you know, they call somebody up and it's just instant. He's not ready. You can't really try guys out right now. You got to either impact or not. Endeavors got Go the day off completely on Sunday. 
Right, which to me is kind of just given how how thin they are, is kind of surprising that they can do that right now. But I well, guess I, and I it. think that's that's good on Alex Cora because I think he realizes, look, without Devers and Bogarts, we're not going anywhere anyway. So those right. those guys, I have to get them rest somehow, some way. There's an afternoon game, obviously on Labor Day, and then we have two more games against Tampa, the off day, and then they uh, where do they go? I, I had that up. Uh, they go. Uh, they play at Chicago with the White Sox. That's when they start the yeah. six game road swing, uh, three with the White Sox and three with the Mariners. Right. And that's, I mean, add to that too. They're going to have to be bringing guys back, you know, potentially in Seattle, they're going to have to be bringing guys back. Cause you know, it's not like if you're on, you know, you tweak your hammy, right. You go on the injured list, you're eight out of 10 days on the IL teams going West. You still travel with the team to the West coast. So boom, you're, you're back, you're off the IL, you're in the lineup. Right. I don't, I, you can't do that with COVID. I don't think where you can be like a day off coming back from COVID IL. And so they're going to be flying guys out to Chicago, to, to Seattle. It really is kind of a, you know, they're this kind of just sprint to the finish here is really going to be wild. And again, I, I sort of said it at the top of the show, I almost wonder if this is kind of galvanizing the team where look at all this, we have stacked against us. Let's, let's, you know, it's going to be a great story here. If we, if we overcome all this and we do something and we make some noise here in October. And I almost wonder if it's sort of having that kind of as unfortunate as that is, because you don't want anybody to get COVID, but it seems like the guys who are still there, who are still in that locker room for now are handling it exceptionally well. And there's going to be more to overcome before this is over. Red Sox beat is powered by the legends brand an athlete owned apparel brand that is popping up seemingly everywhere these days, including many pro locker rooms and on some of today's top athletes. Legends is owned in part by athletes like Steve Nash, Matt Barnes, Baker Mayfield, and NFL legend and local icon Willie McGinnis, and even former Celtic Marcus Morris Sr., among many others. Legends makes high-performance apparel with a style and comfort you'll want to wear all day. Visit legends.com today and see why athletes everywhere are swapping out their big box brands for Legends apparel. Use the code SOX20 that's S O X two zero and save 20% on your first order. Again, that's legends.com promo code socks 20 offer ends October 10th. Alex, uh, let's move on to the offense. Um, I think Kyle Schwarber is starting to warm up, huh? Yeah, no, he can hit, he can hit. I, you know, I know I was on here the other week and I was kind of critical of that trade. It was nothing against Kyle Schwarber. He's a good player. I think. Yeah. Why you just, beat. you don't like Kyle Schwarber. No, I'm joking. The defense. Well, I, I, I like my team having an actual first baseman, but no, he's, uh, he's, he's knocking the crap out of the ball right now, and 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 they need it because JD Martinez has kind of gone cold, and then obviously not having Xander Bogarts in the lineup, there go two of your three biggest bats, and Rafi's still hitting, which is great, but you need a little more than that. So he's been a big part, I think, of why they've been able to go on this little run here. Has been his spark. Well, and as a leadoff batter, he is giving something a little bit different to the top, a, a different look anyway, to the top right. of the order. Uh, he has reached base safely in 19 of his 20 games uh, with the Red Sox, and he's slashing 319, 449, and 569. His OPS is over 1,000 and uh, 1,019. He's 23 of 72 uh, with four bombs, eight RBIs. And most significantly, the reason he's at the top of the order, 17 walks. Yeah. Yeah. 17 walks in 20 games. I heard somebody say the other day, it's Euclid esque. It is. And it, you know, normally those power guys don't do that because you sort of have to take chances and rip at the ball if you're trying to hit home runs like Schwarber. That's what is. we've been told. And, well, it's, he seems to just have this uncanny balance for it. And it's really cool to see. I don't know how he does. I'd love to ask him. I don't know how he does it. I don't know. What his trick is, he may not want to leak that secret out because it's clearly an advantage, but he's like oddly good at that. He is, and I understand why they have him in that lineup and why they acquired him at the time. Would I have liked to have seen them get Anthony Rizzo? Sure. I mean, in an ideal situation, you get the best first baseman on the market for an obvious need, first base, and everybody would have been happy, but Obviously, we know by now Heim Bloom and Sam Kennedy and the rest of the Red Sox brass thought the asking price was too high and they're not giving up on prospects like Tanner Houck. That is not going to happen. 
Although, meanwhile, I will say my guy who they could have had for a lot less than Rizzo, oh. CJ Crone, yes. just won NL Player of the Month. So he did. I saw that. And I, I thought I, I will throw that out there. Although Bobby Dalbeck won AL Rookie of the Month. So maybe, maybe you know, they're okay. Again, the defensive so, side of it's still a question, but he, he looks like he's kind of turned a corner. I want to ask you about Bobby Dalbeck because a lot of people were really begging for the Red Sox to send him down and get him more seasoning. I'm glad they didn't because sometimes I think certain players learn the best when they're up in the majors struggle, go through um, difficult times. Look, Dustin Pedroia, I bring this example up all the time because I think it's most pertinent in 2007. He hit like a buck 80 for the first month and a half of the season, but Terry Francona stuck with him and he realized the kind of player he could be. And I'm not comparing Bobby Dahlbeck to Dustin Pedroia, you know, right down the line. They're not the same kind of player, but I do think Bobby Dahlbeck looks a lot more comfortable at the plate. He's taking so many more pitches and he's not swinging at everything. He doesn't look as anxious. And I think that's why his numbers have really skyrocketed. Yeah. I mean, in the last month, I have it right here. So going back, recording this on September 6th, going back to August 6th, 353, he's batting 353 in 24 games, slugging 765, seven home runs, 23 RBIs, and the strikeouts are down. It kind of goes back to yes, what you talk great about. point. I mean, they're, they're not, you know, down where you want them to be, but 18 strikeouts, nine walks, it's a two to one ratio. That's, that's way better than where he was to start the season. And I think his approach has just changed and it's led to everything else. Cause I've, I followed Bobby Dalbeck for a while. I followed him since before the Red Sox drafted him. He was on the Cape the same summer I was. Oh, this kid knows, this kid knows how to hit. If he can get the bat on the ball, it's not just power. He knows how to place the ball, hit it to all the different fields, et cetera. But he just has to catch up to big league pitching. And like you said, you kind of alluded to it there. You're not going to learn how to catch up to big league pitching by hitting in AAA. No, nope. because then you're not hitting big league pitching. So correct. I think this is, you know, I think this is him. Hopefully, I think this is him starting to turn the corner because I think he can be a player. I think he can be a guy. Let's not forget Rafael Devers first year. He kind of went through some similar struggles. I don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now, but he was like a big strikeout guy to start. And he's obviously turned that corner um, and turned around. Yeah, 240 hitter struck out 121 times his first full season, not technically his rookie year, but his first full season. Um, And he's obviously kind of come around on that. So I, I think patience is the key with Dahlbeck. The defensive thing's another issue. He may have to be a DH someday because uh, it doesn't look like he can play first base. He's got a much longer way to go there. But I think his bat his bat's going to play in the majors. I think it will. It's just a matter of being a patient and giving him a little more time. So Dahlbeck played third base on Sunday, and I think that's interesting because they gave you know Devers a day off. Devers right. did pink shit on Sunday. I, I should say that. Uh, he did strike out in his pink shit. <laughs> appearance for Jack Lopez, but he did not come into the game and play in the field. So uh, that was pretty much, as they say, um, Alex Cora giving Devers his legs the day off. Usually when you give a a position player the day off, you're giving the legs a day to rest and you're not standing out there in the field and running around and doing all of that. But back to Bobby Dahlbeck, I just find it kind of a fascinating case because I do think uh, they can use his bat. He's only hitting 239, but as you alluded to, uh, a lot of the other slashing numbers are improving, especially the OBP now that he's starting to track pitches better. And I'm excited for the guy. I think he can be a very pivotal part of the Red Sox depth in their batting order if they get to the postseason. Yeah, and we've seen this before, just rookies sort of, so, so maybe not struggle as much as he has, but kind of just get their way through the season and the postseason hits and something clicks. We've seen that happen here before. We've seen it happen on other teams before. And he feels like a guy, you know, is there any better time to get hot than right now than heading into September? And it, it just feels like he's getting hot at the right time. We still got a month to go before the playoffs, but we'll see if he can kind of keep that momentum going. All or nothing, Travis Shaw. That's what I'm calling Travis. I love Travis Shaw, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, his numbers indicate that's what you're going to get. You're either going to get a ball that uh, splits the alley, uh, goes to the triangle, um, or goes over the you know, over the wall, either in uh, left field. He can hit with power to the opposite field. By the way, I love his swing when he actually oh, yeah. makes contact. But that's what you're going to get with Travis Shaw. He's going to strike out. Um, you know, he's hitting a buck ninety six. Uh, he had the one hit a double. 
course, on Sunday uh, in the 11 to five loss. But, you know, he was a big part of the comeback, uh, the five runs over the uh, fifth and sixth inning that made a six nothing game suddenly a six five game until the Indians got to uh, Phillips Valdez in the ninth. Yeah, I know. I've always liked Travis Shaw, too. I think he's kind of in the right role when they brought him in. It was OK. Is this their starting first baseman? Are they getting ready to move on from Dahlbeck? And I don't think he's a guy at this point in his career who can be in that spot. But you need a little pop off the bench. And I do think they do. They, yeah. So they do close the season on the road in Washington. Yeah. So having him in an NL ballpark, I know it's just one series end of the year. Everything might be wrapped That's up. That's actually like a pretty good point, Alex. I, I'm but, surprised by that from you. Wow. Um, you know, having it just a, a raw power bat off the bench is, is never a bad thing. They have the room for it, especially now with the, you know, 26 man roster up from 25 a couple of years ago. So, yeah. And I mean, I, you know, as somebody who was 20 for the whole mayor ding dong city thing, like I'll always enjoy Travis Shaw. I'll always personally be a fan of Travis Shaw. He's a fun guy to watch his first stint here. So, yeah, I mean, he was a nice little addition. Again, I, I think the role they have him in is the right one. If they brought him in to be the starting first baseman, uh, that that would have been kind of a panic move to me. But to just have him as another option off the bench, I, I you know, he's as good as anybody you're going to get in that spot. Uh, the Orioles actually did the Red Sox a big favor on Sunday, beating the Yankees as the Yankees could not hold. What was it? A four run lead against Baltimore at home. I mean, the it, it kind of feels like we're back where we were earlier in the season. Right? A, a little bit. Choked. Yep. They've choked a couple times here now, right? The last couple of days. I know they're they're under 500 in their last 10. Um, but, you know, talk about the Red Sox bullpen problems. I Who would you – tough question. I was talking about this with friends the other day. One run game, bottom of the ninth inning, you got to close it out against a good lineup. Matt Barnes or Aldis Chapman, who are you taking? Right now, not at their peak. At their peak, it's Chapman, right, but right now. Right now, I'd probably go Matt Barnes, but not by much. And you're not, ha- you're not excited about it either. No, uh-uh. Exactly. I, and, that's, and I'll tell you, it, <laughs> it, it's not that I, I, I want to kill Matt Barnes. I don't. Um, but, and, and I love to kill a role this Chapman because I think he gets into so many big games and the game gets bigger than he is. And, and I just, you know, so many examples of that, not just the uh, Jose Altuve uh, walk off in um, game six of the ALCS 2019, well, he, I believe it was. But yeah, well, the, Chapman played for your Reds, right? Before yes, he, was in New York. He, he played here in Cincinnati. Um, he was beloved for the, like the first three or four years. He was on that 2012 team that ran through the National League and probably should have won the world series that year. Had they not blown three straight games at home to the giants. Um, but then I, I'll, rem- I'll always remember a world, a world as Chapman for game seven of the 2016 world series, because to me, that summed everything up on the precipice. He allows the game tying home run. Then he gets the win kind of the vulture win in game <laughs> seven for the Cubs. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm just a big fan of guys who can throw 105. Yeah, so who isn't, right? But Right, exactly. Like, you know, the Jordan Hickses of the world, Amir Garrett. By the way, um, by yeah. the way, keep an eye on Hunter Green. Yeah, he could be, if okay. the Reds ever decided to bring him up, he could be a weapon. He is the real deal down in AAA Louisville for Cincinnati. Is he, does he throw triple digits? Is he yes, he guys? does. And okay. he tr- throws a smooth triple digits he is six 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 seven uh, a lefty and just smokes him i mean he is really um fun to watch i i, I, I mean i lefty. always no he's a righty i always try to keep track of those guys so i will i will definitely keep an eye out for that and it would be nice if the red sox ever got one i mean they had kimbrell he threw pretty hard but and they could have had kimbrell again but yeah like, that's another story for another podcast how, yeah. how are you doing otherwise I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, you know, kind of catching up for, for, uh, NFL season, obviously great, great weekend of college football. Hard not to love that. So. Yeah, it was a great, uh, uh, by the way, Hunter green. Yes. is a right-hander. I, I don't know what I was. Okay. Yes. But he can throw a smooth one Oh one, a very nice. smooth one Oh one. He is nice. a tremendous right, picture. Sure. Yeah. I'm looking um, to you like that, uh, Florida state Notre Dame game. I uh, thought of you, Alex. I don't know why yeah, but I, I did. I, I didn't like it because, well, first of all, who likes Notre Dame? And and second of all, I was so excited for Mackenzie Milton to make his comeback. Great story 
right? I, I think great quarterback. I think a guy who, if he doesn't suffer that injury, is probably in the league right now. But he doesn't get the start. They put him in late in the game, and then they blow it for him. It just uh, it didn't sit right with me. I wanted – I wanted them to win that game for him so bad. Hopefully he becomes a starter. Look, the other kid, uh, Jordan something, I forget his last name. He wasn't awful. He threw a couple of picks, but some of them, I think two of those were on the receiver more than him. He made some nifty plays, but I just, I want to watch Mackenzie Milton again, man. He was so good. And it's just so unfortunate what happened to him. I think the doctors, they, they showed a quote from the doctor last night about his surgery. Like, Nothing like that had ever been done before. They weren't sure they were going to save his leg. And now he's out here playing D1 football, going toe-to-toe with the ninth-ranked team in the country. I, I wanted it. I wanted that ending. Hopefully we get another shot at it. Maybe Clemson down the road. I don't know. But hopefully we get another shot at it later this year. So I want to thank everybody for downloading today's podcast. The always entertaining Alex Barth was my guest of 98.5. I want to thank Alex for uh, joining me on this Red Sox Beat podcast. You can follow him on Twitter at RealAlexBarth, all one word. 